Scott Kelly spent 340 consecutive days out in space. You analyzed his molecular data, DNA, RNA, protein, small molecules. Mm -hmm. What did you learn about the effect of space on the human body from Scott? We learned that space is, is rough on the human body, but that the human body is am, am amazingly and monstrously responsive to adapt to that, that challenge. It can rise to the occasion. So we could see there, Scott had, as almost all astronauts do, a bit of puffiness and spikes in his bloodstream of these, what are called cytokines, or these inflammation markers of the body is clearly saying to itself, holy crap, I'm in space. And liters of fluid move to the upper torso and they get a puffy face, what's called the, you know, the astronaut uh, face that is very common, but it goes away after a few days. And some astronauts maintain high levels of stress for their whole mission as measured by cortisol or some of these other inflammation markers. Whereas Scott actually had a little spike, but then he was cool as a cucumber for most of the mission. But he had spent, at that time, that was the longest ever mission for a US astronaut. Uh, a few cosmonauts have gone a little bit longer but there'd never been a deep molecular analysis of what happens to the body after about a year in space. So it was the first study of this kind. And what we found is when he got back, you know, we saw all the same markers of, of uh, stress on the body and changes spiked up to levels we'd never seen for any other astronaut before. So it seemed like going to space for a year wasn't so hard as much as returning to gravity after a year. It was much harder on the body. Uh, he notoriously had, you know, broke out in a rash all over his body and really, uh, even the weight of clothing on his skin was too heavy. It created all this irritation because his body had not felt the weight of just a, a simple T-shirt. It, was, it wasn't really, had zero weight, of course, right? So it went up in space. So that led to all this inflammation, all these changes. He had to, you know, it, it was much more comfortable just to walk around nude. In that case, it was for a medical reason. Some people yeah. do this, you know, recreationally. He was yeah. doing it for medical purposes. I do it for medical reasons I mean, as well. <laughs> that's right. All the time. I mean, people say- I have a uh, prescription, <laughs> the doctor told me. <laughs> so, so he was allergic to earth, you yeah, say, which exactly. is fascinating to think about, actually. How quick did his body adapt there? So there it was about three to four days he got back to normal, at least in terms of the inflammation. But what's ex extraordinary is that we measured a lot of other molecules, genes, uh, structural changes, tissue, looked at his eyeballs, looked at his vasculature. It took him, even six months after the mission, a lot of the genes that had become activated in response to spaceflight were still active. So things like, we could see his body repairing DNA. He was being irradiated by cosmic rays and by the radiation. It's the equivalent of giving a, like three or four chest x-rays every day, just in space. And we could see his body working hard at the molecular level to repair itself. And even in his urine, we could see bits of what's called 8-oxoguanosine, a form of damaged DNA that you could see coming out. Uh, and we see it for other astronauts as well. So it's very common. You could see damaged DNA, the response of the body to repair the DNA. But even though he'd been back on Earth for six months, that was still happening uh, even six months later. How, does, how, do you, wait, how do you explain that? So some of this has to do with when you have a gene get activated, you might think, oh, it's like a light switch. I look at my wall, just flip a light on or off. And sometimes turning a gene on or off is that simple. Sometimes you just flip it on because the gene is already ready to go. Mm -hmm. Other cases though, you have to reprogram even the structure of how your DNA is packaged. Yeah. It's just called an epigenetic rearrangement. In that case, we could see in it that a lot of these genes had been, you know, his cells had changed the structure of how DNA was packaged and it remained open even months after the mission. Now, after about a year, it was actually almost all back to normal. 99% of all the genes were back to where they were in pre-flight levels. So it means that you know, eventually you'll adapt, but there, there's almost a, a lag time, kind of like jet lag for the body, but jet lag for your cells to repair all the DNA. What was the most surprising th thing that you found in that study? There are several surprises. One is just that he, that the repair, like, as I just mentioned, that the repair took so long. I thought maybe oh, a week or a few days, he'll be back to normal. But to see this molecular echo in his cells of his time and space still occurring was interesting. His telomeres was one that was really surprising. The, the caps on the ends of your chromosomes, which keep all your DNA packaged, and you get half your chromosomes from your mother and half from your father, and then you go on and make all your cells. Normally, these shrink as you get older, and telomeres, is, is length is just an overall sign of aging getting shorter. His telomeres got longer in space. And so this was really surprising because we thought the opposite would happen. So. He, that was uh, genetically one surprise. And also some of the mutations we found in his blood, he had less mutations in blood, as if his body was almost being, like a low dose of radiation was sort of cleansing his body of maybe <laughs> the cells that were about to die is one of our main theories on what's happening. And of course you can't really, you have theories, but you can't 
Because <laughs> the number of subjects in the study is small. Right, right. It's the it's notoriously one of the lowest powered studies in human history. Yes, but 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 what you what you lack in subjects, you can make up for in the number of sampling times. So we did you know, basically two hundred and sixty samples collected over the course of three years. So we really almost every few weeks had a full workup, uh, including in space. So that was the way we tried to make up for it. But it, we, but we've tried in other model organisms. In mice, we've seen this. We've looked now in fifty nine other astronauts. And in every astronaut that we've looked at, their telomeres get longer in space. Does that indicate anything about lifespan, all those kinds of things, or no? You can't make any of those Not kinds of jumps. Yet. I want to make that jump yet, but it does indicate that there is a version of cleansing, if you will, that's happening in space. A, a mixture of, you know, we see this actually clinically at our hospital. You can do a low dose of radiation with some targeted therapies to kind of activate your immune cells is even even tried clinically. So the, this idea of just a little bit of stress on the body or what's called hormesis might prime you into active of, clen of cleansing things that were about to die.